So let's skip the uninteresting stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Future challenges for hackers. Um, if you take a look at operating systems today, they come in much better basic out-of-the-box security than in the beginning. For example, if you start up Windows, uh, Windows XP, Windows 95, out of the box, four or three years ago, or you have an old SUSE Linux from version 4.3 or something, it runs with so many open services, um, no, well, basically no security at all. If you take a today's look at what, it, what you have as security if you install the Solaris box, SUSE Linux, or Windows XP, much higher security level. And this is going to be better. So every developer of software will try to do better security out of the box. Because they're, they're actually trying yeah, to do trying. security out of the box, which is uh, new. <laughs> yes, that's new. It's very, let's take, for example, Microsoft. Microsoft learned a lesson. <laughs> and now everybody's pushing Oracle because they haven't learned the le lesson yet. Exactly. Yeah, and they will have to learn too. You know, the, the, the comment is, uh, we won the war. Uh, security people basically kicked Microsoft ass year after year after year, and eventually they're like, oh. Okay, that's something our customers are wanting. I mean, literally, like, before they'd go to a call and it'd be, hey, you know, where's this new Office feature? Now it's, hey, how come my network died last week? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's why you end up seeing things like SP2 that have everything that we were telling them to do, because it leads to networks being, you know, more likely to run. Yeah, and next thing is that all security development companies usually now do source code audits. When we, in our company, we started source code audits, only very little companies were interested in that. Today, all major software developer companies, they all want source code audits, and they hire external security experts to do this. It's also done internally, but they hire external security staff to do that, because they have not all the competence inside. So this, again, leads to more better code. Then we have buffer flow protection techniques. Um, on the first day, we had a very good talk from Stealth about how to circumvent the, an, an X bit on the hammer, so the AMD64 processor, which is very cool. But then again, this is something which will be fixed. So there will be more and more protection which will prevent buffer overflows. It will still be possible, but it will be much, much harder to exploit. There will be many occasions where we will not be able to exploit that. Then intrusion detection will be more and more widely deployed. So whenever you try to hack into a system, they will ring an alarm. So your zero day exploit, which you might have had, can even be detected and whoosh, access is gone. 10 minutes after you thought, hey, I made it finally. Um, also the knowledge of administration and also of management gets better time over time. Um, when I started computer stuff, and got at university and started hacking. Um, there was no courses about security, nothing. Today in university you learn about, okay, this is IPsec, this is key exchange, basics of cryptography, this is how you program securely. So at least the fundamentals are being teached now. You have all the books available, which is also not the case when we started. So the um, white hats get better and better. So what do the black hats do, or gray hats in that regards? And then patches are issued faster. So the time is, here is a security problem, let's wait two years until the patch is getting out, and let's wait two other years until the absolutely hacked system finally gets a security patch installed. These times are also gone. So desktop firewalls become more common, antivirus software gets better. So what do we do? I mean, it's always an arms race, which means the hackers try to get better, then the white, guy, white hat guys cover up, and then we have to get back, better again. So what should be the next steps for us? We have to adapt to that, of course. So um, in that basic presentation, um, I made different colors for stuff. So blue means um, that I did a presentation course and training course afterwards, which showed many stuff. So that was blue, so they already knew, okay, we would learn that in the training course. Green means that this software or techniques already exist and you can already use it. Um, yellow means it exists only partially, so we need some people here 
at the conference maybe who start developing that stuff, and red means it doesn't exist yet. So even more power of us is needed to develop such software. So first, external reconnaissance. Um, stronger filtering and of course that the management is stronger, the system management makes stronger monitoring, makes attacking harder. So before that, we were just rushing at the target, scanning, port scanning everything, live scanning everything, flooding their logs, um, and it was okay because they didn't care. But this is changing now and will be more changing in the future. So as soon as you start scanning, already, already companies are doing that, you start scanning them and then you're already blacklisted. Even before you get the first active port, you're already blocked off. So what do you do then? Yeah, so this can't be the way you can do it in the future because then you, you can't get to the step to try hacking because you're locked out before. So in the future, the low profile techniques will be most important. So you use, use more of Google and stuff to find every information and um, perform topology mapping. Um, who was in the IP version 6 presentation in the morning? Oh, so many people were awake then. Okay. So I talked, for example, for the record route option, which is untraceable and you can't turn it off. Only some firewalls just silently drop that packet. Um, this can be easily used, for example, to do good network topology mapping. Um, there are other stuff, like you have an active connector, like downloading some file from a web server, and you have a tool which once in a while um, resends the packet with a lower TTL. Yeah? This will never be picked up by an IDS, yeah? but this way you can do a trace route without being found about that, because every IDS can show you, oh, this, this guy is doing a trace route. TCP, UDP doesn't matter, but you can do it very stealthy if you know how. Yeah, and then of course identify the application of the public services, like they have to have an open SMTP port to receive email, they need to have their public DNS, they need to have their web service running and B2B gateways and whatsoever, and these will be points of entry. So, so port scan done directly, this is what you will not do in the future, because automatically locked, shut down, doesn't work. So you're not port scanning, you might check some ports from some sacrificial lamp system, but that's it. We just go for the known public service, so you will attack mails, web, and DNS. Yeah, this way you will know that something about the target, not as much as you will know today because of the massive port scanning stuff, but at least the victim will not see it coming. And this is a basic point. If he doesn't see you coming, he can't shut you out, and he will not notice when you're trying to attack, the real attack. So the future of attacking. Um, the problem is and will be that exploits will be a very scarce resource. If you're reading bug track mailing list or full disclosure, disclosure or something like that, you will see there are lots of vulnerabilities being found. But if you take a look, what is it? Vulnerabilities are, it's software nobody uses. I mean, a guestbook, blast, PHP, whatever version, never seen before on the web, of course. Yeah. And it's not Windows, it's not Solaris, it's not the Apache web server, it's not IIS, it doesn't help you. So when have you seen the last remote exploit on Microsoft IIS? When was that? That was long ago. When was the last one in Apache you could exploit? That's long ago. And this will be getting much tougher than that. The interesting exploit will be get very scarce, very scarce. So, um, so what will happen is that lots of the full disclosure stuff will not go full disclosure anymore, but to go internal hacker groups. Like for example, it was done in TESO. Lots of stuff the TESO group did was never released. It just stayed internal in that group. Good people forming a team and no information should get out. This is what, which will be much more in the future. So what we'll do, source code analysis from public and closed source. Yes, some people have Windows source code, Cisco source code, HPUX source code, AIX source code. Lots of stuff you think, oh, that's internal. Nobody has this source code. The source is out there. Many stuff is open source where a company would not hope it's open source. <laughs> so if you know people, ask them. If you have something to trade, usually can get everything. Firewall one source code is out there, for example. Not the newest, the newest NG version, but all the versions you can have. There's lots of stuff. 
Then again, for all stuff where you can't get the, the source code stuff, you have can binary analysis like EDA. EDA is a very cool tool to, to do binary analysis. Even without source code, you can find overflows, logical errors. It's, lot, it's very tough. I have lots of problems with that because I'm not an assembler guy, but without assembler, you're fucked. It doesn't work. It's hard to understand. If you program C, it's easier to get in. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> anyway, but binary analysis is also one of the major tools. And if you take a look what the security companies and hackers are currently doing, they're all focusing on binary code analysis, like iDefense, like ISS. Um, if you look what Halver is doing, and FX, for example, the Phenolead guys, they're all doing bin binary analysis, and that's for a reason. So it's actually interesting looking at what you just said from the white hat perspective. Yeah, and the, white hat, tell me. <laughs> so the beautiful thing, I don't know if beautiful is the word, but the reality is, is that um, there really used to be a perception that if it's compiled code and there's no source code release, then the bad guys obviously can't have it and can't understand it. And it's because of things like, A, all big source code ends up leaking, and we know this is true, and B, even if it doesn't, you know, was it four hours between a Microsoft patch release and people figuring out what exactly was patched and reverse engineering the exploit from it? That is the reality of systems, and it's become part of the reason why patching has become something that was, yeah, do it as maybe a, you know, if, if you want to, to no, you, you have to fix your systems. The mere act of releasing patches is such a loud burst of, this needs to be fixed, because especially now with the patch out there, it's been documented. So on the one hand, you really have this release, you know, this decrease in how much data is given to the white hats. And on the other hand, the black hats are so good at pulling out information. I generally point out in that point, the patches, Halva wrote something very cool, oh, yes. bin diff. You take two binary files and it shows you the as assembly difference of what changed in that file, that patch. So by that, you can find sometimes in Microsoft patches, they are patching a security hole they announced, and the same, in the same patch, patching two other security holes they are not telling about. ASIN 1, very favorite, where they patch more than one stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there, there's um, a long, long history of you, you don't always tell people what you're patching. But, you know, the reality is, is that they're finding it. Oh. So, you know, one of the actually the interesting things that's evolved has been, uh, you know, there, there really is a market for vulnerabilities. There's been a black hat market for, say, several years at least, probably yeah. longer. Um, Some people making lots of bucks with that. Unethically, I wouldn't say to that. Well, you know, what do you think of, like, the, the eye defense and the tipping points, the, the white hat vulnerability buyers? Um, who is subscribing to these services? It's mostly three-letter agencies. I mean, who needs exploit code if they just want to secure their own systems? So, uh, so you know, I've been talking with Tipping Point, and the discussions have basically been like this. So you're telling me I have some huge industry-spanning vulnerability that, you know, dozens of vendors need to be communicated with. Dear God, that's going to be a pain in the ass. Wait, you're going to pay me so you can do all this work I don't want to do? I'm not seeing a problem there. And, you know, to your, your, your assertion would be their problem is that they're just giving it over to governmental agencies in some interim period? No. Well, it, now we talk about ethics. And ethic is if you do hacker stuff, um, it should be free, it should be open. And you should not make money by that, by blackmailing companies or cracking their, their databases and stealing the data there and selling it to other people or doing spamming services by um, renting your zombie networks and stuff and also not writing exploit codes and selling it to three-letter agencies, yes. At least that's, that's my ethical thinking. Uh, others might think different and do. <laughs> And I don't disagree. I think ultimately it's hard to be an ethical person in security if you're not trying to get things resolved. If you're trying to go out and, and break stuff, then, but it sounds like you kind of support the breaking of stuff. Would that be an exaggeration? What do you mean by breaking of stuff? 
So, so earlier, you know, you were talking about the, uh, the, the distributed war dialer. Yeah. So, so how does that play in, a, in an ethical framework? I don't mean to be putting you on the spot. I, may, I just think it'd be an you're interesting doing, discussion. You're doing. <laughs> um, well, I'm not doing anything criminal. True. So I'm always trying to experimenting in, well, getting to know where the boundary is and playing around on the boundary. So I'm, I'm programming lots of tools which can be used for very evil purposes. I'm not doing th that myself. And I use all my tools legally in my job. Yeah, always. So it's not like, oh, I'm... Developing a gun, giving to people and, and, and ignoring that. I'm doing that. I'm legally in my business using my own tools. Yeah? i just giving others the opportunity to do the same. War dialing, source good stuff, you know, it, password it, cracking. It, it is a legitimate point to be made that there really are a lot of critical networks that have these, phone, these open phone lines. And there's that old perception from the past that, well, these things will never get found. Yeah. And you know, just like we had the, oh, these vulnerabilities in, in code will never be found. Oh, these, no one will ever dial these lines. So it, it sounds like your tool at, at minimum would lead to, you know, okay, we really can't have just open modems and open lines. Yeah, exactly. So, so how do you think, suppose you could do whatever you wanted, you know, you wave a magic wand. How would you deal with the remote administration problem? You know, how do you, would you allow sites to securely, remotely administer critical systems? Because that's why a lot of these modems are there. A lot of them are against, like, you know, Cisco routers, and there's a, you know, mm. if, if the network goes down, you can always dial in. How should it work? Challenge response passwords, one-time password stuff, modem only activated on a central console if, okay, we need a success. The basic stuff, I mean, that's 101 on security. It's not... Knowledge which is new, I mean, you know, it's all documented everywhere. You just have to do that. So you've been doing this for, for years and years and years. How have you seen, have you seen similar improvements in how remote management is handled? You know, from, you know, yes. I've, yeah, I have seen that. Also, it depends on the awareness. The first time you do war dialing um, for a company and you find everything open, you can power down their data center. <laughs> it's just because the modem is there, you dial in, oh, I can turn off the power. Great. I mean, they have two, but controlled from one console where you can dial in, very good. Or um, most German um, companies have the Siemens, Siemens and PBX system. Very nice, remote dial in, standard password, never change. Siemens also advise or should not be changed. If you are the administrator, you know how to do that. Um, you can do it, but I so far I hacked all of them because then they choose very weak passwords. The strongest one was one, two, three, four, five. I had so far. No kidding. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. This no special skill is needed. A kid could do that. Yeah. But then again, after this happens, they change. They learn. So oh, we have to do it. Oh yeah. Okay. Sometimes even you, they didn't knew about that. For example, if you have an EMC um, database. Um, hard, whatever you call it, um, large hard disk space, they all have a remote modem to dial in on a Linux box. You have to know that. If you're just some manager of an operation center, you don't know that. So. All right, I think there's actually some potential here. Uh, uh, disturbingly embarrassing security holes we found in audits. <laughs> so um, I don't know if oh. I'm going to name the company that was involved here, but uh, you went to the web interface for... Uh, you know, for, for user administration. And it would say, you know, here's the username and, uh, oh, here's the password. But the password was, you know, all asterisks, all circles. And I'm like, hmm, that's the right number of circles. View, source, scroll down. Yeah. When you actually viewed the source on the user description page, it actually had the password in clear text. <laughs> but don't worry, it's displaying it in an HTML password field. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, people do some incredibly stupid things in terms of attempting to secure systems. And the worst is when you see it. I mean, that, that was specifically supposed to be a security mechanism. Like, this is security code that I was working on. What kind of stuff have you seen? Oh, the best thing I ever performed was an penetration test for Danish 
um, outsourcer, so critical stuff. Um, I could hack um, their Linux box on the DM set. Well, it's, that's not so special, okay. Um, they had voice over IP in their internal network. So everything that was four years ago, so voice, the Cisco voice over IP phones, they were pretty new, so they were, this was state of the art, bleeding edge. And well, they were not sure how to configure it. And they configured like many companies do today. Well, you just do um, VLAN, but the Q type of VLAN, so it's just VLAN tagging. And well, you just have to tag your packets like I want to be in this network on this VLAN ID. Yo. So I scanned, oh, I saw some tags. Oh, they have VLAN Q here, cool, great. Let's check, let's tag into all VLANs which, which are there and see what we can find. Yeah, and there was this, vo this voice over IP network. Uh oh. Then I started, installed an ARP spoofer, the parasite, my ARP spoofer, man in the middle, transferred all the traffic over my DM set system, transferred it out, played web files of the internal phone communication <laughs> from the internet. So this was the coolest hack I ever had. <laughs> Did you have any issues with the codecs that were being used, or was it all 711? Because it was internal. 711. I mean, today either will can play that. In back in that time, it was not possible. So there was some hack of putting software together to finally hear something and present that, and they ooh. Oh, uh, my, my favorite was uh, so you look at Vomit, the the, the first of the voice over IP sniffers. Yeah, it and, is. And, and, and so Vomit said, oh, intentionally, we don't have a mode that will play audio straight off the network. And I look at it, and I'm like, wait, this thing accepts files, and PCAP will take traces from standard in. So it's just like TCP dump, dash W, dump to standard out, vomit, dash R, read from standard in. Oh, look, vomit's working in real time now. No. Stupid little tricks. No. Well, but maybe to continue on, on that stuff here, um, some, so what some expert hackers are doing, and it, that you should be aware of, especially of, if you're a developer of some important critical piece of software, um, they monitor all changes. So every change, every CVS change you're doing to OpenSSH, to Apache, to bind whatsoever, they get daily in an email. And then take a look what was changed to be the first one to discover a new bug. And more and more people will do that in the future. Because if you can hack OpenSSH, because there was some programmer doing a little error, or in Apache or in bind, you've got the crown jewels. So this is what others are doing, so learn from the others. Yeah, as I said, hackers won't publish their vulnerabilities, but trade with the fellow hackers. Um, well, in the last years, it was not needed because there was just so many vulnerabilities. You could just here have, have it, give me some back something later. Um, the scarier the market is, so you will need to have to something on hand to trade. Um, what already is happening, but not as um, professional as will be the next years, hackers will collect, well, they, they will de try, they will have their targets, like I want to tar target CNN, Microsoft, blah, blah, whatever company, bank XYZ, and it will find out what are the servers, and what servers do they have. For example, oh, on this IP address, they have send mail in, in this version running, and they have Apache as web server running on that server, and keep a database. And whenever a new vulnerability comes up, they check their database, oh, to watch can I hack in now? And also checking how often will they update their software. So if there's a new patch available, and you see from your database course you're scanning regularly, oh, they needed, they needed three weeks to implement the patch. This is very interesting information. I know two people who do that already, and more and more people will do that. Because otherwise, you're losing your edge. Yeah, and also important for vulnerabilities, it will not, there will not be that many who, this is administrator or remote root or whatever vulnerabilities. So in the future, you will have to combine small hacks, exploits to exploit to exploit to finally get root. So in the first, you get in into root shell as no whatever user. Then you use a kernel exploit to get break out of the root and a final exploit to get root on the system or something. Something like that as an example. So the one vulnerability I'm, I'm in and I'm root and I'm God, this will 
This will not happen in the future. Trusted compartments and all that you will see and already have on many systems if you just configure them. This will make life much, much harder. So once you have access, um, oh, is the yellow, can it be seen in the backside? Of course, I can't even see it on my screen. <laughs> um, yeah, direct kernel patches. I mean, I wrote that nine months ago. Direct kernel patches are today state of the art. I mean, that's, it's even yellow, so I thought, oh, not that much is intelligence put into that. And I heard even of a Solaris rootkit, which does that now. So direct kernel patch is important. No loadable, loadable kernel modules and stuff. If you root directly right to memory and change things you want, cannot be found. Leaving no traces, very important for forensics. The expert hackers today don't write to the file system. Everything is in memory. Yeah, of course, also for Windows XP in 2003 and stuff, of course. So, system backdoors. Um, for Windows, this will mostly be um, doing stuff with DLLs. Um, a friend of mine working in our company once did a forensic job where the, the, this Gina DLL was replaced. And the password hash would always be the same if you set a password for a user. Find that. Password, oh, if you know that hash, you can get, account, get, get into every account. Find it as a forensic expert. Find that bug, that hole. And backdoors will be much better, so much more, much better hidden take over sessions inline like it's a normal web server, but if you type one special get command or one special op option, it just triggers something special and gives you a shell or information. Well, shell can be easily detected, but you can also do like hidden commands and hidden replies and HTTP very easily, that's very nice. Yeah. Let's see, what was that slide I was talking about? Yeah, preventing tracebacks. Um, as ISP now work much more effectively together, it will be harder to, be, uh, to cover your own back. Um, so you need more systems routine as hops. Um, you can use transfer and proxy stuff. I'll show you next slide because it's something I programmed about two years ago and pre um, presented at CCC camp which is nice to transparently attack systems, but still be very remote. Um, well, just using the wireless LAN stuff of other people, because, well, they getting the visit, um, not you. And backdoors will prevent any type of online forensic stuff. So disable locking, freeze the system if they try to. Yeah, internally, this is also something interesting. Um, it will more and more go to passive stuff, as I told. So, like passive OS fingerprinting, this will be very interesting and much more used because you are not allowed to scan, the IDS is triggered, boof, access is gone. So you have to be very stealthy as internal, so everything has to be passive. Also, injection attacks will be more common and not the, oh, I exploit that SMTP service. So passive will be the main stuff. Um, yeah. Grand scanner, that was the software I was coding, which is some kind of socks for hackers. Who knows socks? Uh, more people should use that. I mean, it's very, very cool. Even, you can even use it with UDP now. So let's assume you hacked maybe well, some old Apache bug doesn't matter into that Solaris web server in the DM set there. So, this, from this web server, you were allowed to um, connect to a database on a Windows machine, like SQL server, for example. Um, also buggy, so you got access to this system as well. Um, what this software allows you now is to, to um, define transport endpoints. So you say, uh, you're starting Nmap on your own machine, but all the connects Nmap is doing is performed from the internal web server. So you're starting your local commands, 
and it's all done internally on the internal web, internal network. You can do this with socks. You can do this with this tool, or um, we had once so one talk we had two yesterday on the first day from the French guys about the syscall proxying. Yeah. Similar technique. This is just TCP/IP. They they try to do well system level stuff. Mm -hmm. So similar concept. Um, this is very, very interesting stuff. This makes hacking much more easier. In old times, you would have to deploy, to get all your exploits and tools down to, to the Solaris box. You hack the next systems. Oh, now I have to get all my Windows box to the Solaris box and from the Solaris box to the Windows machine. This sucks. So just installing a little proxy, they can get that to all the stuff. It's easier and better for anti-forensic purposes. There are no tools. Yes, open the, the, the comment was open VPN would be easier. Yes, or the new SSH version will have the same capability. It will be even easier because it will be more even installed by the administrators on the system. What do we want more? Um, yeah, of course. But unless we do, you don't have that, and open VPN is much harder to install. You need root privileges. Um, for Grandscanner or SOX, you don't need root privileges. You can do that as a normal user. So if you don't get root, it doesn't matter. You can still use this box as a hub. So this was an example. Um, so what, in, that, in that tool, what you just do, you put gg space in front of the command you want to do. It just intercepts all connects you want to do, transfers to the remote proxy, and there these are, the connects are done remote. So this was a port scan I did with Nmap from my own machine. And on a different machine, this was the, um, the grand scanner where it was running and then so, oh, doing the port scanning. This is with locking, you can see which TCP um, scan worked and which, which failed, so one port was open, others were closed, and that's why you see, oh, port 111 is open. Yeah. Yeah, future of worms. As long as IP version 4. Oh, well, hang on a sec, you know. Okay. We actually, no, speaking about the future of worms, that's interesting stuff, yeah. Well, they kind of died. Like, we had our big, nasty summer of worms, what, back in 2003. <laughs> and we haven't had that again. I mean, come on, Zotov yeah, was why? a... Yeah, but why? Why is the question? Why didn't we, didn't we have such a, such a warm epidemic anymore? Of uh, global firewalling? I would rather say it's because there were not that high-profile exploits. There were patches much before, and people patching faster. Mm -hmm. So a worm was too late to infect other systems fast enough. So once there is a zero-day exploit, it will be the same again. That's my prediction. But that's the thing. Then it's arguable that we haven't had a sufficient zero-day exploit in, what, two and a half years? That's an amazing... I mean, security is not an industry where things get better. <laughs> like, it usually gets worse and worse and worse, and it did seem to get better on worms. Well, from the code I have seen on Worms is that it is still, it's still bad. If it actually has its, if it has its source exploit, but it hasn't had it. Yeah. So I think in, in terms of Worms, because I've been thinking about this a fair amount, it seems that the game is going to start becoming about uh, enumeration, where you no longer have these huge floods go out, where instead it's all about looking at, you know, look at this local network, infect all the local guys. They infect on, you know, basically you have to lily pad from network to network, but then you can do quick enumeration once you're there. Yeah. That's the only way I think that we're going to start seeing this kind of stuff start to work. Yeah. What I agree is that the worms need, will need to be more complex to be successful. But warm code produced today is bad code. If you take a look at the intelligence of bots yes. they're using, very professional, skilled programmers, they know what they're doing, they are clever. Warm programmers are more, well, kind of script kitty like I mean, if you see, um, Tom Vogt was doing, I think, last year or two years ago, a speech on how you could do worms more effective, how they can spread, spread even faster in things. It's easy to implement that. They're not doing that. So, you know, from an, it's arguable to say that in terms of attacker popul you know, attackers, the, the worm deployments never got persistent and never stayed around long enough. The bots are actually a very effective parasitic threat. 
yeah. that have actually been, you know, enormous, you know, the hundreds to thousands to millions scale. Um, what do you think we're going to start doing about botnets? How are we going to manage these things? That's one of my private research projects to find out how to shut them down. I haven't found a very effective way for that yet. I'm still researching that. Um, I'm talking to one guy who is very in-depth in, well, researching that and fighting against it, so a whitehead guy, and he said what is already starting to appear is peer-to-peer -peer stuff with full RSA, so asymmetric encryption. And then you're fucked, because you can't do anything. Yeah? You can't say the kill command to the whole botnet because you, you don't have a secret key. And you can't do anything about it. You can kill one of them, but he is connected to more, and everyone is just sharing two or three connections to other bots. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, peer-to-peer -peer networks are infamously unstable. I mean, how much was Kazoth just thrashed? I mean, the various peer-to-peer -peer systems got destroyed. Not, I don't want to say destroyed because there are a few that actually managed to keep around, but you know, peer-to-peer -peer systems are notoriously difficult to, to keep living in the face of determined uh, mm -hmm. attackers. I wouldn't Sibbles. agree so. I would, I would say if it's for data, large data transfer and, and, and effective communication, well, there are more peer-to-peer um, -peer software where you, can, where you can, so if you are too slow, well, your users use Kazar or eDonkey or whatever, so there's competition there. But if the main concern is just, I want to have always connectivity, doesn't matter how bad my data rate is and how much traffic I'm using miss, uh, just for getting, getting my, my peers, um, yeah, it's possible. You can just share with them, okay, I am connected to these, randomly get some. I think it should be easy to implement an algorithm for that. So their constraint will always be bandwidth then. They will always have to make a lot of noise to keep things up. Yeah. But it's encrypted, so you will just see if it's port 40, uh, 443 done for the communication, what will you do? Hmm. It's not an IDS can pick up, oh, un what is that communication on port 6050? This is weird, and it's, um, it's um, high entropy, so it must be encryption. This must be bad. Well, if it's, well, okay, hmm. so if it's, if it's not SSL, then it's just unknown encryption format. If it is SSL, you can basically identify that it doesn't have a CA. I mean, obviously, I'm going to say obviously, hopefully the botnets aren't going to go ahead and get a deal from VeriSign. <laughs> Well, you can just steal a certificate, doesn't matter. Just hmm. hack the one web server with SSL is enabled, steal the certificate, you have a certificate. Well. Hmm. But they can't all, but the certificates get tied to DNS, and the DNS won't return the correct IP address forever. Uh, That's true. You, the, oh, you yeah, can you, play you, some you, tricks on oh, that. Oh, man, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> Now it's getting interesting. So here's the problem. Oh, tomorrow we will code a new tool. <laughs> So the problem is, is that, yes, you could absolutely go ahead, break into a site, and steal a cert. And the cert would be totally, you know, a valid cert. And the IDS would now be faced with this problem. They, could either, just, they could either just trust that this DNS name goes to the IP address of this box, or they could doubt it. Which means now they do a lookup. Which means now they're doing a lookup to an attacker-controlled name. So... <laughs> The IDS can go ahead and end up completely exposing itself, or it has to trust a cert with no good information. Either way, it loses. Yeah. That's not good. So, I think bots are really a problem, and we will not get rid of that. Of course, there's much money behind that, and with money, you can buy a lot. Now, when there's that much money behind that, there's probably not that high a population of people who are... How large do you think the bot producing population is in terms of groups of programmers? I have not the slightest idea. Maybe someone else has. Does anyone here has an idea or knowledge or know people or stuff? I mean, okay, some are in jail, some others work in German computer companies now. Or Israeli companies, doesn't matter. Um, anybody, any idea? Would the bot hackers please stand up? <laughs> No, or just knowing a friend who, or a friend of a friend who. <laughs> so, you know, what, what is the, the ultimate alternative I mean, if, if bots become this huge problem? So we all have personal computers, and all the personal computers have persistent storage, and ultimately, 
you know, we control what they do and we get to have them altered in ways that make our systems behave more like we want them to. Now that's one technological option, but it's not the only one. Um, when it comes to Linux boxes, if I want to be running Linux, I pretty much always put a Nopix disk into a system. Because every time I put in that CD, it's going to be fresh and it's going to just work. And maybe it won't have all the customizations that I want. In fact, it'll be missing large numbers of them. But it will just work. There's a completely different technological path that involves systems being black boxes that erase themselves every time you turn it off. Now, we always look at these things as a whole. I look at this thing with horror, this path with horror, because I love customizing my systems. But you know what? I also like the fact that my system works the same every time. So, or it actually works. So if, if the bot problem isn't gotten under control, the ability to have persistent changes on our own systems will give it up ourselves because our systems will just not be doing what we want them to be. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. So yeah, I mean, there are reasons why we, you know, if, if we lose this battle, the shape of computers will, you know, did anyone here actually use Minitel over in France? Like that crazy, horribly expensive pre-internet thing? One of the, again, porn industry leads to more, uh, um, how you saw, e-commerce stuff being used. Minitel was not very interesting in the beginning, but then online porn, and then it was used very widely again. People really don't realize. So I heard this incredible statistic, um, at least for the United States. What percentage of hotel room stays in the United States do you think involves someone going ahead and buying the porn? 10%? 20%? Half. Half of all ho hotel room stays in the United States, someone gets the porn. The other one is doing that for free. Of course, you can... <laughs> <laughs> there was yesterday a very nice speech about the infrared stuff, which showed you how I can do it for free. Just doing an USB TV works all the time. Oh. I have such a device, but just by accident. <laughs> Incidentally, you guys all know that USBs basically a packet level format that looks very suspiciously like IP. Like, you just oh. run a USB sniffer. It's not some magic protocol. Yo, it's packets. I mean, there's actually code out there. You, there are actually devices you can buy that will route USB over IP. Oh, so we're done with time. Uh, we've had a great time up here. Thank you well, so much. Well, at least you were not bored, we hope. <laughs>